Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. most important teachings of the Buddha is his teaching on the nature of mind. And so quite a famous uh, few lines. He said, this mind bhikkhus, and again, remember, bhikkhus in its broadest sense means anyone who is walking on the path. So he's really talking to us. This mind bhikkhus is luminous but it is clouded by visiting defilements. So what does this mean? The mind is luminous, but it is clouded by visiting defilements. What does this mean in our experience? You know, we hear a sound. It's very simple. There's just the knowing of the sound, or feel a breath, or feel the sensations of a movement. In the simplicity of just knowing, there's no problem. It's in that respect that the mind is luminous. Luminous here means the knowing capacity, the capacity of the mind to know. The nature of this mind, the nature of knowing, the nature of consciousness, in and of itself, is open, it's clear, it's unobstructed. It simply knows. So an example or an image which I came across, uh, which expresses this really well. I was in a bookstore and I saw, just browsing, and I saw this title, The Nothing That Is. And I thought, (laughs) this is for me. And the book actually was a history of the number zero. So I got it. I thought this is, this is the teaching, the nothing that is. So the first line of the book said, it was by Robert Kaplan. He said, when you look at zero, you see nothing. When you look through it, you see the world. And I thought that was such an apt description of the mind. When you look, when you look at zero, when you look at the mind, you see nothing. There's nothing to find. Look through it, and you see the world. Well, I got through those first two lines of the book, and then it got too mathematical. (laughs) (laughs) But those two lines were worth the purchase price. (laughs) You know, when you look at zero, you see nothing. When you look through it, you see the world. So the question arises, both on retreat and in the busyness of our lives, what obscures this natural clarity? You know, if the nature of awareness, the nature of consciousness is clear and unobstructed and open and luminous, why don't we live our lives from that place of simplicity? You know, what, what obscures this nature? When we look carefully at our experience, we see that what obscures this clarity of mind, clarity of awareness, and what causes suffering in our lives, both for ourselves and for others, are the arising of the visiting defilements. And in Pali language, the word for defilements is kalesa. You could say the unwholesome states of mind. One term that we use for these states are afflictive emotions. Those emotions that are the cause of suffering. And there's a long list of them, as we all know. Anger, fear, anxiety, jealousy, resentment, greed, envy, ill will, unworthiness, frustration, depression, (laughs) grief. There's a long list of afflictive emotions, emotions that are painful. 
that really causes suffering. It's natural for most of us that these feelings will arise at different times. Our challenge is learning how to be with them in a skillful way, in a way that transforms them from being afflictive, that transforms these emotions into freedom. And so that's what I'd like to talk about tonight. The Buddha went on to say in first line, the mind bhikkhus is luminous, it is clouded by visiting defilements, which means they're not always there, but they do arise. He goes on to say, the mind bhikkhus is luminous, it is freed from visiting defilements. So he's pointing out the understanding that we actually can free our minds from the suffering that these cause. So how is it freed? How can we free the mind? The first and fundamental step in working with these afflictive emotions is something we've already talked about. It's acknowledging and recognizing them when they arise. You know, and there's a wide range in our abilities to recognize and to know what we're feeling. For some people, it's very easy. You know, they're, re- they're very tuned in to these different emotions, and when they arise, they recognize them clearly and quickly. So for some people, it's quite easy. For some, it's difficult. You know, we might be going on our merry way in our lives, being driven by different emotions that we may not even know are there. You know, maybe we feel something, but we're not tuning in, we don't know what they are, but still they're causing us to act in our lives, in our relationships, in our work, but we're not tuned in, we're not aware, and so they can be the cause of a lot of difficulty. For others, we may know what we're feeling, so the recognition may be there, you know, we're we're tuned in, but we may very well be in the habit of, of being lost in them, of being carried away by them, by being overwhelmed by them, you know, this flood tide of emotions. So there are many different ways we can train ourselves to be mindful and to connect more mindfully when they arise specifically with the afflictive ones. And these are the emotions that I want to emphasize this evening, although it applies equally to all emotions. So one way of tuning in is by becoming more aware of our bodily sensations. You know, maybe there are sensations of tightness or contraction or agitation or tension Now, sometimes these sensations are residue of past emotions or past reactivity. So it doesn't always mean that these sensations reflect a current emotion. But if the sensations are enduring and maybe even strengthening, you know, we're feeling more and more tense and tight and contracted, that could be a signal for us to take a look. Okay, is there some emotion underneath that is causing this reaction in the body? You know, maybe there's some anger or frustration or whatever. So these physical sensations can be a signal for us to take a look and see what's there. Just as an example of this, in my younger days driving on narrow New England roads, I would find myself getting tenser and tighter whenever I found myself behind a really slow driver. Because they're curvy roads, it's difficult to pass, there's somebody... Come on. (laughs) I could feel it in my body, which was definitely a signal of something... (laughs) going on in my mind, 
like impatience <laughs> and frustration. And of course, as I've gotten older, I have become one of those slower drivers. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I actually have compassion for the people behind me. <laughs> So that's one way. We tune into our body. Another way we can tune into the emotions, the afflictive emotions that we're feeling, just to begin to notice, you know, in any activity, when we're feeling slightly out of sorts, just some malaise, and we don't really know what it is, but we're not in the easy flow of our lives. You know, so something is going on. Or maybe there are a lot of obsessive thoughts just that keep coming again and again and again. These are signs, these are signals. These actually can serve as a mindfulness bell. You know, that feeling of unease or the obsessive thinking. That's like a bell that wakes us up to look and say, okay, what's underneath that? What's driving that feeling? And usually when we look, we see, yeah, there is some kind of afflictive emotion going on. It might be unacknowledged worry or unacknowledged fear, you know, or anxiety. So again, another example of how just when we're feeling ill at ease, it can become a signal to look. When we opened IMS, this was in 1976, we just had our 40th anniversary. Uh, for the first 13 years, uh, I lived in the center. I had a room in the center. And sometimes I had to switch rooms because people needed it. When I was 40, I realized I need to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it was enough. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> living right in the center in a room. So through the amazing generosity of one particular student and friend, she actually offered uh, a house, to build a house for myself and my colleague Sharon Salzberg. So it was, it was you know, an unbelievable gift. So that's its own story, the obsessive mind <laughs> in the designing and building of the house, but that's not the point of this story. <laughs> so it gets built, you know, and move in and when I first moved in I did a month self retreat I thought that would be a good way to you know, enter into living into my new home well my mind started going a bit crazy the house is too nice <laughs> Dharma teachers shouldn't be living in such a nice house maybe I'll move out and give it to the staff and I just my mind was obsessing about this and feeling very uneasy, and it was generating all these thoughts. And finally, I said, Joseph, what is going on? You know, what are you feeling? And I realized I was feeling embarrassed. It was just, I was feeling embarrassed about living in this really nice place. As soon as I saw that, as soon as I recognized it clearly, I realized... I would much rather feel embarrassment than move out of the house. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the whole thing became a non-issue. <laughs> but before I recognized the emotion, before I recognized, I couldn't accept it because I wasn't recognizing it, and it was driving all this unease. So that's the power of bringing clarity to what we're feeling. We actually are able to be accepting of it because we're seeing it. So this is really important. I mean, this is, you know, that's one somewhat trivial example, although at the time it didn't feel trivial. But in our lives, this is what's happening. We can also pay attention. It's a signal for us that something is going on when we're in the middle of some action, we're doing something, and there's just some part of us that feels a little uneasy about it. You know, we feel, oh, maybe this is not quite wholesome or not quite a right act. When things feel a little off, 
you know, when we're doing something, and we, we all at different times will be doing greater or lesser unskillful things, unless you happen to be fully enlightened. So this is going to happen, but we can start paying attention to it. You know, and just to that feeling of being slightly off, that can become a signal to, uh, to look, okay, what, is, what emotion is driving this action? Is it greed? Is it ill will? A very good place to work with this, and this would be after the retreat at home, is in our speech. You know, how often are we talking in a way, maybe it's gossiping about somebody, maybe it's something that is just not quite right. And we know it, and this, whatever delight we get out of doing it, but if we're paying attention to that sense of, no, this isn't quite right, so then we can actually investigate. Well, why am I doing this? What's the motivation? And so we can actually come to a much deeper understanding of ourselves and our actions in the world. That becomes another signal. Sometimes we don't recognize different emotions because we're not seeing the full range of what's going on. We may be seeing and recognize what's on the surface, but not seeing what's underneath. Because very often emotions come in clusters. You know, it may not just be a single, a single feeling. Two years ago, uh, and for a few years, I was teaching uh, retreats for lawyers and law students and law professors. So it was that it was that crowd. And one of the th- one of the third year law students on one of the retreats said something really interesting. Of course, they're involved in a very what's the word litigious profession. You know, so there's a lot of conflict and a lot of stress. And just in the discussion of the meditation and, you know, what his experience was, he was saying, I need to get angry in those situations so I don't feel the fear. And I thought that was so interesting. You know, so in that situation, you would manifest and feel anger all as a way of avoiding feeling the fear, which he felt would make him more vulnerable or less effective when actually learning to be accepting of the fear and to say, yeah, we can act. There can be fear there and we can act in the face of fear in the experience of fear. It need not stop us if we're accepting of it. But if we don't recognize it and we don't come to that place of acceptance, so then it drives us to other unwholesome states, to other afflictive emotions. But you see, this is, this is an amazingly rich arena of investigation because it's such a big part of our lives. You know, we know maybe underneath feelings of anger, you know, we, we're aware of that. But if we don't look deeper, we don't see, well, what, is there something underneath that? Maybe there are feelings of hurt or frustration or self-righteousness or resentment. There can be a lot of emotions that are actually fueling the anger. And if we don't see them, so then we, get, we stay caught in the anger. You know, so we have to look a little deeper. What's important to understand is that this investigation in this realm is not discursive. It's not thinking about it, and it's not digging into our psychological history and life story. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm suggesting that we investigate. Rather, it's understanding that there's a wide range of afflictive emotions as well as wholesome ones. Sometimes they're obscured, Sometimes we're not aware of what's going on and we can use various uh, suggestions 
as a way of looking and investigating, but it's not by thinking about it, it's by settling back and just opening up in a very intuitive way. We're just kind of dropping into ourselves. We could say we're dropping into our heart to see what's there. And if we learn how to do that, very often what's there simply reveals itself, just as it did with that you know, being embarrassed about the house. I, I didn't think it out. I just, what's going on here? And then it revealed itself. That's the kind of investigation I'm talking about. It's intuitive. It's just getting there for what is present. Sometimes we don't recognize the emotions that are present because we're misperceiving them. We're taking one emotion to be another. So I'll give you a few examples. At one time, I was feeling what I thought and what I was taking to be sadness. And so I was noting and being aware of sadness, sadness, sadness. But it was really staying a long time in, you know, that feeling of kind of being caught in some way. So that feeling of being caught, that kind of piqued my interest. You know, what, how am I getting so hooked in this? So I looked more carefully, and I saw that it wasn't sadness. It was unhappiness. Now, these are close, but they are different emotions. These are different feelings. As soon as I saw accurately what it was, that allowed for the alignment with it so that I could be accepting When I was misaligned, acceptance is impossible because we're not actually there for what is actually present. Is this clear? Kind of. And so when we're caught in something and we try, you know, all these different ways of looking and seeing and understanding and we're still caught, we might just check to see, am I perceiving this accurately? And it's very easy to misperceive you know, we could, we could mistake frustration for anger. These are two different feelings. Here's a big one. This is, this is a life practice for you. We can mistake attachment for love. Try that one on. <laughs> and this is another whole talk. <laughs> They are two very different feelings, and they are often conflated. And that conflation can be the cause of a lot of suffering. So clear recognition of what emotion is present. And again, particularly the afflictive ones, because they are the ones that are causing a suffering the next essential piece first is recognition and then it's mindful acceptance of the emotion because if we're not accepting of it if there's aversion to it we're actually feeding it so they are afflictive right and if we're not aware and we're not accepting they are going to be the cause of a lot of suffering. So we have to understand what acceptance means in this context. What does acceptance mean in terms of an emotion that's afflictive? It doesn't mean justifying them. It doesn't mean wallowing in them. It doesn't mean judging them. Rather, it's simply the full acknowledgement, yes, anger is here, fear is present, frustration is present, jealousy is present. We're there for it, we recognize it, we're accepting of the fact that this is our current experience. So in this regard, acceptance is just another word for mindfulness. How do we know whether we're accepting of it or not? A very good feedback, and I talked uh, 
in my groups this morning about this. This has proved very uh, freeing for me. One of the best feedbacks that we're not accepting of something is the feeling of struggle. If you're sitting, if you're walking, if you're in your life and you just feel that you're struggling with something, that struggle means only one thing. It means something is going on that we're not accepting. Because if we were accepting it, we wouldn't be struggling. It doesn't mean that we don't act. But it means we have to come to the acceptance of the fact that it's there. So things that come up a lot in meditation. You're sitting and you just feel you're struggling. Instead of just getting caught up and identified with being the struggler, let that be a signal to take a look. Okay, what's going on that I'm not open to? It might be some unpleasant sensations in the body, you know, that are in the background. We don't want to feel them, but they're there. So there's an internal struggle. It may be some afflictive emotion that's going on that we're not open to. It may be that the mind is just thinking the whole hour. And if we're not open and accepting of the fact that that's what's happening, we get into a struggle. So you can use this sense, which is very uh, visceral, the sense of struggle. It's actually a gift to us. It's telling us, look to see in the mind and body, in our experience, what it is that we are not open to. What are we not accepting? So at one point I was practicing in Burma. Incredibly noisy. I mean, this is a monastery. It's right in the city. And they were doing a lot of construction in the monastery. And right outside my room, they were straightening uh, steel rebars. So they were banging metal on metal all day long, every day. <laughs> I came to Burma to get enlightened. <laughs> and they're banging away in this very unpleasant sound. So I was caught up in my own reactivity. And after a while, and it took a while, okay, what's going on? You know, how am I getting so caught in the reactivity? And so I just look, okay, what's going on in my mind? I said, oh, complaining mind. That's what my mind was doing. It was just complaining incessantly. As soon as I saw it and could name it, it ceased to be a problem. Because when you're noting, when I was noting, complaining mind, complaining, complaining. In the noting, the mind wasn't complaining. I was actually being mindful. So this is just another example of how we need to recognize and be accepting of what it is that's actually present, not fighting with it. Now, sometimes we don't recognize and accept afflictive emotions because they're too painful or uncomfortable. You know, and just like with physical pain, we have to train ourselves to realize it's okay to feel it. You know, and that happened in the practice. You know, in the beginning, we might feel a little bit of faint pain and we get really upset by it. But over time, we relax and, okay, it's unpleasant, it's painful, and it's okay. It's the same thing with painful emotions. It's okay to feel it, but the tendency may be to avoid. You know, this is too uncomfortable. Well, maybe the emotions that are arising don't fit our image of being a good meditator. Good meditators don't feel angry, don't feel greed, don't feel pride, don't lie. 
Therefore, greed and pride and dishonesty can't be arising. You know, we just deny the fact that that is actually what is going on because it doesn't fit our self-image. Well, we really need to wake up from that one because that is the cause of so much self-delusion where we're living in the pretense of something instead of the actuality of what is actually going on. As long as we're unwilling you know, to be, to feel certain emotions, we're, we're really living defensively. We're living in fear and we're creating all of these inner structures to avoid feeling them. Our practice is to realize it's much simpler and much freer to be willing to feel the unpleasant mind states. It's okay. It's okay that it's unpleasant. Sometimes, though, we do need to take it slowly because some emotions, some painful emotions, can be very powerful. They can be overwhelming. Sometimes people are dealing with trauma, trauma from the past or present trauma. And the emotions are so intense and so overpowering, the mind at a particular time may not have the capacity to hold it in balance. So we need to recognize that as well. Now, when there are powerful emotions coming for whatever reason, and we feel we're getting out of balance, we're getting overwhelmed by it. So then the skill in the practice is to learn how to back off a little bit. You know, we we give the mind some space, some rest. We move away from it. So it's not always plowing through. And this is really important because it, it can actually be harmful at those times to think, I'm a meditator, I have to be with it. It's not the wise thing. There's a lot of nuance. You know, this is the art of meditation. The methodology... You could say in one way, it's very scientific. It's a, it's a very precise methodology. But it's also an art, you know, in terms of how we're relating to all of our experience and particularly to powerful emotional states. So we need, we need the, the mind and the heart of an artist. From this foundation of recognition and acceptance, we can then bring some wisdom to this whole world, to this whole arena of our emotions. We can begin to apply what has aptly been called emotional intelligence. So one aspect of this wisdom mind with respect to emotions is discerning the skillful from the unskillful, the wholesome from the unwholesome. In both cases, whether skillful or unskillful, we need to have recognized it and we need to have come to the place of acceptance of the fact that it's there. But once we've landed in that place of openness to what's arising, then we can bring discernment. Okay, is this skillful? A skillful emotion mind state, one that's onward leading to happiness? Is this an unskillful, unwholesome state that's onward leading to suffering for ourselves or others? The Buddha gave a huge emphasis to refining this discernment. And it's really what brings an ethical dimension to psychology, to an understanding of the mind, brings an ethical dimension to to our meditation, it brings an ethical dimension to our lives. What is harmful to ourselves or others? What is not harmful? What is beneficial? We really need to be able to see this clearly. But this discernment can be a very delicate undertaking. Because for many people, it's a very easy step from saying a particular mind state like pride or envy or jealousy or greed or anger, whatever, 
It's a very easy step from seeing that it's unskillful to saying, I'm a bad person because it's arising. You know, and people very often do this. They personalize the emotion. And so then it be- characterizes in our minds who we are, defining us. You know, that I'm a bad person for having them. Or we may have the feeling that it's wrong that these feelings are arising. That's not what this discernment is about. It's not wrong that they're arising. They're arising, and they're arising because of conditions, and they're arising in all of us. We need to recognize them. We need to be accepting of the fact that they're there. And then we need to see, oh, is this wholesome? Is it unwholesome? If it's unwholesome, it's, if it's afflictive, it's not that it makes us a bad person for having them. And it's not that they shouldn't be there. They are there. But with that wisdom, we can then make some choices in our lives. Is this a mind state that I want to cultivate? Is this a mind state or emotion that I want to let go of, that I want to abandon? Without that discernment, we deny ourselves the possibility of that choice. And we're just going on in our lives, living out whatever particular conditioning we have. So we discern what's skillful and unskillful, not in order to judge ourselves. Even though you may notice that pattern arising, that's not the point of this discernment. The point is to make wise choices in our lives and in our practice. But as with clear recognition, and acceptance, there are nuances to this that, make, that can make it difficult to really see clearly what's skillful and what's unskillful, what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. Because some of the unskillful mind states are very seductive. And we justify them to ourselves. So this is one of, uh, a line from one of the suttas, the teaching of the Buddhas, that is so apt as are all the rest of his teachings. <laughs> he said, anger with its poisoned root and honeyed tip. You know, there's part of us which loves it. You know, it's energizing and we feel powerful and we can feel self righteous. You know, that honeyed tip of anger, but not seeing, as the Buddha said, its poison source of ill will. It's really rooted in a kind of hatred, but that can be masked. So this, just another example of this, it's this I read in an article about uh, the writer Anne Lamott, She described how difficult it is to deal with the triumphs of other writers, particularly if one of them happens to be a friend. (laughs) So this is quoting. It can cause just the tiniest bit of havoc with your self-esteem that you are hoping to to find that you are hoping for small bad things to happen to this friend, (laughs) she says, for, say, her head to blow up. (laughs) These thoughts are going to come, you know. But we can see them, and even see them with a lightness of heart. It's so important to begin to discern what's skillful and what's unskillful. And the Buddha was, I mean, he made it easy for us because he, he pointed out, he said that all unwholesome states are rooted one way or another in greed and hatred and delusion. And all wholesome states, one way or another, are rooted in non-greed, generosity, love, and wisdom. So there's, there's a roadmap, you know, for understanding what it is that's going on. 
it's particularly important because these different mind states, both wholesome and unwholesome, are not simply arising in our own hearts and minds, but they are what motivates our actions. Why is there so much avoidable suffering in the world? You know, and we're bombarded with how much there is. You know, the violence and the war and hunger. You know, there's enough food on the planet, but it's not being distributed very well. You know, or the oppression of racism, or homophobia. There's so many situations of intense suffering that's avoidable. So what's going on? Why is it still happening? It's because people are acting out the mind states of these afflictive emotions. It's acting out fear, and it's acting out anger, and it's acting out hatred, and acting out greed. These forces are exactly the forces that are the cause of so much suffering in the world. And it's not only other people who have these mind states. One of the beauties of a retreat... was expressed very well by a character in the book Zorba the Greek. Do you remember that? From the 60s or back, way back then, by Nicholas Kazantzakis. One of the characters has this line, self-knowledge is always bad news. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> You're here, we're all here in our practice if you've come expecting light and bliss and rapture and floating away into the clouds, you've probably been disabused of that by now. <laughs> but even if that were possible, it's not the point. We really want to see with wisdom what it is that's going on in our minds, you know, what it is that's going on in our hearts, so we can make this discernment. So we're taking responsibility for these forces which cause suffering in the world, we're taking responsibility for our part in that. But we can only do it if we're paying attention carefully, if we see and learn in all these ways you know, to recognize the afflictive emotions when they're there, to become accepting of them, accepting of the fact that they're there, discerning what's wholesome from what's unwholesome, so this is not only for our own happiness, but it's really for the benefit and happiness in the world. Okay, so we talked about recognition and acceptance. We talked about discernment of skillful and unskillful. The last step in working with afflictive emotions and with all others is both the most difficult and the most liberating. And that is learning how to be with and to feel all of these different emotions and then to learn how not to be identified with them, not to be taking them as I or mine. It is this understanding seeing the selfless, empty nature of the emotion, whatever it may be. It's that understanding which transforms otherwise afflictive emotions into freedom. So what does identification with an emotion mean? You know, how do we experience that? I'm sure you're familiar with it because it means being lost in, being caught up in, being captured by, you know, carried away, 
taking them to be self. This is me. This is who I am. There is a huge difference, and I would suggest you play with this the next time some strong mind state comes. There's a huge difference between experiencing it as I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm greedy, to there is happiness, there is sadness, there is anger, there is pride. Just changing the way we language it will change our relationship to it. But the habit of identifying with it and taking it to be self, I'm angry, I'm this, I'm that, that habit is very strong. So in the meditation practice, we, we need to retrain the mind in terms of how we're relating to these emotions. You know, as our practice deepens, we can see with greater and greater clarity that the I and mine is extra. We are adding that to the experience. And it would be interesting for you to notice when you feel caught up in some state, you know, when you're really caught in and identified with it, if you can remember, notice the feeling of contraction. You know, there's a certain tightness that happens when we're identified with these emotions. And then notice the difference if you're mindful enough in those moments to go from, oh, I'm so angry, to, oh, there's anger, or anger is like this. Notice the difference in your body. You know, we go from a place of being contracted and tight, uptight, to a place of relaxation, to a place of ease. The emotion is the same, but we're relating to it in a completely different way. This is the wisdom mind that transforms the afflictive emotions into a place of freedom. One of the ways of not identifying, of learning not to identify so much with these powerful states when they arise, is to see their conditioned nature. They're arising out of certain conditions. And when the conditions change, the emotions change. So it's actually possible to be with them. It's like watching cloud formations in the sky. You know, and there can be powerful rain clouds, you know, ominous looking. But if, we, if we're just sitting back watching them form, the conditions change and then they dissolve in the clear sky of the mind, there's no tension in the experience of them. So one way of seeing or experiencing the conditioned nature of emotion, and this is really fun to do, fun in a certain kind of way, <laughs> is to see the relationship between thought and emotion. And I have found this completely fascinating. I have noticed so many different times a particular thought arises, maybe it's a thought about some difficult situation that I have to face or a thought, a very seductive thought, you know. <laughs> and I, have not, I have seen how a thought can arise in the mind and immediately trigger a strong emotion. Thought arises, fear. Thought arises, greed. Thought arises, ill will. And even, <laughs> even when we have experienced this very same thought and very same emotional response a hundred times, Sometimes I'll just, I'll just play and I'll purposely have the thought, you know, just to see the response. 
And it's so amazing. It's so impersonal. And it really makes me just marvel at the mind. I mean, here's his thought, which in itself is nothing. It's just an insubstantial nothing. <laughs> and yet, it can be so powerful and triggering, this whole emotional response. So to see that again and again and again, we begin to learn not to be so identified with the emotion. We say, yeah, this is just coming out of that particular condition. Of course, it works the other way, too. Different emotions can trigger a lot of thoughts. So just seeing that cause and effect relationship. We can understand the conditioned nature of emotions by seeing that our level of wisdom, our level of understanding, will very much condition how we feel about things. So for what, what for one person could be really upsetting could leave another person completely at ease. So a famous example of this, and I tell this story often because it's so apt, you know, of the poet Ryokan, the Zen master, and he was, I think, 19th century. He was this hermit up, you know, just lived in the mountains of Japan, uh, led a solitary life, very poor, he just lived in this little hut. And he was a great poet, and this, there's a lot of his poetry, you know, that one can read now. And he just wandered through the villages playing with the children and going back to his hut and meditating and maybe writing some poetry. Well, one day he came back to his mountain hut and he found that the few possessions he had had been stolen. So, being Rio Khan, he wrote a little poem. <laughs> the moon at the window, the thief left it behind. Okay, imagine you're going back after the retreat, you go back to your apartment or your house, everything's stolen. Oh, the moon at the window. <laughs> the thief left it. I don't think so. <laughs> Depending on our level of understanding, of realization, we will respond very differently to the same circumstance. So it just points... These emotions are conditioned by so many different things. It's possible when we're in the midst of different strong emotions, and again, particularly the afflictive ones, the ones that cause suffering for ourselves or others, we can begin to kind of call up our inner Dharma coach. You know, because we have that wisdom mind within us. And sometimes it's just remembering and calling it up to remind us. So, for example, this is one teaching the Dalai Lama speaks of a lot. You know, and so often with many of the teachings, whether it's of His Holiness or, you know, of the Buddha, so often we hear things or read things and it just seems like a good description, and we don't take it as an instruction. So one of the Dalai Lama's favorite things, I think it comes from Shantideva. Um, when anger arises, you know, when, when we're really in the throes of it, the inner Dharma coach, the wisdom mind, is the reminder one's enemies teaches one, one's patience. And so we should really honor our, our enemies. <laughs> They're teaching us patience. But how often do we think of that? You know, in the midst of some conflict, you know, when we're caught up in anger, do we stop and reflect in that way? Mm, not unless we practice doing it, you know but it actually has the potential to free us, to appreciate what can be learned in that situation instead of being caught up and totally lost in the emotion. So we use that inner Dharma coach. We might reflect, you know, what I'm really angry about when we're, when we're caught up. Is it really that important given the magnitude of suffering in the world. 
you know, we can get we can get caught up in such a narrow little space and blow it up all out of proportion to really what's what's going on. And so it's just a reminder for us. Oh, it's okay. I don't have to be quite so caught by this. It makes some inner space. So one teaching of the Buddha, which is a very high bar, and I love it because <laughs> it just points to a possibility in terms of a reminder for us, kind of an inner coaching. So he said, bhikkhus, there are five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Okay, so he's talking about people talking to us. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with a mind of inner hate. So people can speak to us in all of these different ways. Here and because you should train yourself thus, our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no unskillful words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness. Okay, so just imagine there's this person who is speaking to you angrily, harshly, lying, filled with hate. Our mind will remain unaffected utter no unskillful words, abide compassionate for their welfare, filled with a heart of loving kindness. So that's a high bar. But even to hear those words and to know, well, can I remember, even, even just remembering it, even if we can't do it in the moment, but just remember, yeah, that is a possibility. We don't have to be caught up in our own inner reactivity. So there's a possibility here of actual transformation, of freedom for us in our lives. So all of these practices, you know, the clear recognition, acceptance, discernment of what's skillful and unskillful, learning how to be with the emotions without identifying with them, without taking them to be self, to see their conditioned nature. So all of these ways of working with these powerful mind states open up the possibility of a much deeper and greater happiness in our lives. We can really begin to see how all of these mindsets, all of these emotions can self-liberate in this space of open awareness, the open sky of the mind. We're just with them, we see them, we recognize, we're accepting the fact that they're there, we see them with wisdom, and we also see that they arise and pass away. So we come to a place of much greater ease, much greater freedom. I'd just like to close with a couple of lines from the Persian poet Hafez. Ever since happiness heard your name, it has been running through the streets trying to find you. <laughs> it is trying to find us. We can be happy. We can be free. Yeah, and so this is really what our practice is all about.